Hi, Christian. Welcome to the podcast. Hi. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, me too. So I always like to give my guests the opportunity to introduce themselves in their own words about who they are and what they do. I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, thank you, Krista. So my name is Christian Sundberg. Uh, my body is 43 years old right now, but <laughs> I am aware that we are not actually just the human characters that we're playing <laughs> right now. <laughs> I know that sounds strange to a lot of people, but about 13 years ago, I had an awakening experience where I had taken up a long-term meditation practice and I began to have out-of-body experiences. And I also began to have pre-birth memory return to me. So I remembered a time preceding this life in which I had chosen this life and signed up to experience this. And so while I'm still very much veiled, uh, now that awareness that we are not just this is, you know, is right there for me. So I'm just very motivated to try to reach out to other people and to share. <laughs> because who we really are is just such an amazing... Oh, such an amazing message full of so much good news and hope. You know, we're just, we're, there's nothing actually to fear in our lives here. And so I just, I just feel so motivated to share, you know, some of what I can, even though it's so beyond language, you know, about what we really are, who we really are while we're here on earth. Mm hmm. Yeah, I can't wait to unpack your book with you. I <laughs> have a lot of deep questions. Thank so you. I'm I'm always interested in everyone's life journey as in the human experience of, of religion, because I feel like we are evolving away from it. Um, and some of us are uh, evolving into it. But what was your early childhood experience with religion, spirituality, or nothing at all? And then kind of where did you find yourself as an adult? And what are you anchoring yourself in these days? Yeah, thank you. So I was raised in a household that was primarily Lutheran, so Christian, and I really saw the world through that lens for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I, so I've always been a spiritual seeker, but that was the system <laughs> that was handed to me and that I understood the world through. I was actually quite devout in my church. I served as an assistant minister for 20 years. And mm -hmm. I was on the church council when I became an adult. I was uh, as a young adult on the church council and I taught confirmation class actually. <laughs> and um, the pastor actually asked me to uh, consider going into seminary. So I actually very seriously considered that at the time, though even at the time before my awakening, you know, I kind of sensed that the spirit was bigger than what we could put in a box. So I didn't feel quite comfortable committing myself into a certain belief system even then. Uh, but when I went through my awakening journey at the age of 30 and onward, you know, it really meant a uh, quite a deconstruction of the belief system that I had up until that point in my life that took a lot of humility <laughs> and courage, you know, because there were a lot of things that I just hadn't seen or that I had believed uh, incorrectly. And that is okay. You know, that's the nature of um, how the experience is here. We see out from the beliefs we're handed. The world reflects back to us the beliefs that we hold. Um, so, you know, I saw the world a certain way through that belief lens. It takes a certain level of awareness and um, willingness, I think is probably the right word, to actually call that into question and to begin to actually see the world through a new lens. It's, it's, it, it can be very challenging to the ego to do that because it's very fear-provoking. So, uh, yeah. So now, at this point, uh, for the last 13 years, I don't feel the need to associate with any specific tradition, though I do enjoy certain traditions. I speak at a Unity Christian Church. I belong to a Presbyterian Christian Church. Um, but I no longer feel the need to identify with any set of form. Um, I'm happy to practice spirituality either through them or not through them <laughs> on my own. In fact, I feel my relationship with God is stronger than it's ever been, to be honest, even though, mm. you know, that word is even, even the word itself is so limiting. It's much bigger than, than even that word. Uh, but yeah, this is a very personal mm -hmm. process and uh, something I experience every day. Yeah. That dis deconstruction process is so disorienting and, adding the ego, the fight that you have with your ego is a real thing, plus all of the domestication and conditioning. I, I deeply know that process myself. And I, mm -hmm. and because there's so many people here on earth living um, in that, the confines of what has been presented to us as the reality of what God is, 
it's really hard to challenge that. And usually you become an outcast and it's, it's yeah. so challenging. So <laughs> I really appreciate you saying all of that because that's definitely accurate. Yeah, you know, it's it's uh, very much uh, accurate in the sense that we so not only are the beliefs handed to us and we don't know to look any further, but we think that this world and the things right. in it are all that there is. So then, when when we take that away, it, it feels at least at first like, well, what then is there? It's like being out at sea without a life raft. You know, the ego <laughs> yeah. the ego really wants to grab onto something. Please tell me what to believe in so I can feel better, kind of thing. Uh, you know, but this process of truly awakening to what we are. It requires, it calls for a deep surrender into even that which you don't know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that, but that can be an actually really beautiful and liberating process. Because underneath all the fear, love and peace and joy is what we really are. <laughs> so yeah. it's okay to explore. It's okay to search and to really call into question and to really explore explore what we are, explore what life is, and actually accept and fully meet and fully process everything that we experience here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even if that means letting go of certain belief systems and and uh, going at it without knowing, like admitting to yourself that you don't know. <laughs> that can be hard. <laughs> Yeah, I, I had this experience coming out of my own religious experience where I was very much indoctr indoctrinated and it was very fear-based as well. And as I started unraveling everything and really discovering who I was, I realized that there was so much of what we were taught was caught up in this, I, what I would say, an illusion of certainty, which I know you address in your book and we'll talk about here in just a little bit. But it's funny because what you mentioned there about surrendering that we don't know, it was weird because I had this moment where I was like, I almost feel better that I don't know everything than <laughs> saying I know these things for sure. Because th that saying, you know, for sure, you can get challenged a lot. And there's a lot of people who don't believe and there's differing opinions about it. And, you know, whatever the case may be, and being able to relinquish that uncertainty was truly liberating in a way that I, I can't even really describe with my own words. So it's interesting you hit on that as well. That's beautiful. Yeah, the the, uh, the uncertainty is, is it's genuine to acknowledge it. It's authentic yeah. to acknowledge it. Because <laughs> there's a lot we don't see here. There's a lot we don't know in the physical. But yeah. we're in a society where everybody pretty much claims to have everything figured out most of the time. <laughs> yeah. When really, even as a whole species, we have very, very little figured out. So yep. yeah, that it's like you know the Plato and Socrates. You know they they would say the first step to wisdom is knowing you know nothing. Oh my gosh, that's, yes, it really is true. It's <laughs> I mean, so you really profound. have to acknowledge. Yes. Wow, I uh, I don't understand. And one thing I'll comment on that though is that um, part of the reason that we feel that way is because form itself, that means objects ideas, thoughts, everything that is based in this local world is mm -hmm. not fundamentally real. It's not the fundamentally real substance. And so we can't actually find the answers here. One of the, one of the reasons we're confused because we keep looking at the ant, we keep looking at thoughts and forms and books and ideas and this object and this system. And then, well, which one, where are the, where are the answers? Mm. That entire thing arises within something much deeper, much vaster, much less limited so you can't put that much larger context into the small local box. It just it just doesn't work. <laughs> it's like not having the right operating system for your technology. <laughs> yeah, it is something like that. It's like being inside of like, I don't know, Minecraft, the video game. <laughs> and you're inside Minecraft and you're like, you know, you, know, you dig with blocks and you everything is, it's a block world inside a video game. Mm -hmm. And then you say, where in this game is the real mm -hmm. world? I don't, I can't find it. Well, you can't yeah. even, you can't possibly express the depth and the richness of our world in Minecraft blocks. <laughs> mm -hmm. No. Similarly, you cannot possibly touch the richness and the vastness of our higher natures or the higher realms with the language that we have, with the belief systems yeah. we have. Because everything we have here is based in our local system. Even things like linear time and discrete mm -hmm. location, these things that seem so obvious to us, <laughs> they seem yeah. like fundamental properties of reality. They're actually not fundamental. Discrete location mm -hmm. is um, actually an illusion. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, there's, yeah, well, we're going to unpack all of that. Okay. <laughs> Let me just take a moment here to, before we get any further, because yeah, we yeah. could just go on, I think here, but so you wrote this beautiful book called A Walk in the Physical, and I feel like I've been looking for this book probably my entire life. So I'm 
I'm deeply, deeply indebted to you that you wrote this book because it, it encapsulates when you go on your spiritual awakening and you sort of start to understand that there are all of these, these things you don't know and it, and that, that you do know, which is also another thing we'll, we'll unpack here. <laughs> yeah. There also is like a very, I felt for myself, a deep sadness in wanting to go home, but like, where is home, right? And you talk about that in the book. Um, yeah. And also um, a very significant experience that you mentioned earlier of being able to like have this pre-birth experience and decide your life. And so let's tell the people uh, real quickly what your book is about, what's what was it in its intention? And then what do you hope that it's going to do in the world for people like me and yeah, everyone sure. else over Thank <laughs> you. trying to figure it out? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So my book is called A Walk in the Physical. Uh, first, I'll mention that it is available to be read for free online. It's not about money. I'm not just trying to sell it. I want the <laughs> message to be shared on mm -hmm. my the book page of my website. It's available at the third link down. So A Walk in the Physical. Uh, um, I feel like it's my life's work, actually. I feel it was very important that I kind of actualize it, deliver it in this in this place. It came mm -hmm. to me over a period of six years in chunks. I never once sat down and said, I'm going to write a book now or that I'm going to work on my book. That's never how it arrived. It was always like pieces like inspirational arrivals and I just mm -hmm. recorded them and it took about six years for all the chunks to arrive. <laughs> mm. And the intention of the book is to provide a concise encouraging framework to help understand what the human experience is within the larger context. Like, what are we doing here? <laughs> mm -hmm. What is going on? And who are we really? And that is so beyond language, it becomes extremely difficult to try to present in this format, like we have mentioned. Yes. So I try to do it in a way that's nonlinear. I felt that was the way I was called to present it, actually. Like, if I was just going to sit down and write it on my own, I think I would do something a lot more linear. But the way mm -hmm. that it's presented is a short section that's only 14 pages long or so that describes in very concise, structured language, what is the human experience? What, do we, what, what are we and what are we doing here? What's the value of this experience and why do we come? And then there are 160 essays that are referenced throughout that part one so that if a given sentence calls to the reader, they can go read about that sentence. Because mm -hmm. spiritual growth is not always um, linear. <laughs> like we each have a certain idea or a certain encouragement or a certain thought that might help us at a given time. This book is, does, is meant to help the reader find that one sentence that is their next piece. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so there are 160 essays on various topics about what we are and what we're doing here and what the, what the world of form is and why we're using it and how we should you know, consider using it. And then there's a section in the book, part three, that's question and answer, where I try to speak to all of the um, the standard big questions, <laughs> which are difficult to put language on. I, I don't claim to have all the answers. It's not like that. But I have been asked these questions over the years, so I began to record my own answers, and eventually that helped me to create part three of the book. And mm -hmm. there, that's organized by topic. So if there's a topic that is of interest, you can go right to that topic and just read about that. And then part four of the book is a meditation exercise and some thoughts on how to relate to your own journey, because that is a very personal and unique process. And I mm -hmm. find that meditation is a very important part in that process. So I definitely wanted to lift that up in the book as well, because ultimately this is not about ideas. The book can be helpful because of course it's words, it's ideas, but what's more important is your own experience. <laughs> like yeah. what are you actually experiencing and how can you actually find and get in touch with who you really are underneath everything that you're not? Everything, every, Underneath everything that you've associated with, which is not you. So all the negative self-perceptions and mm -hmm. the rich story of this life that seems so deep and convincing. Trying to help the reader find underneath all of that story, who, who do you sense deep down who you are? And I love that you said before, you know, like about what we already know. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. it, yes, that's so important that we seek that out and find that and intuitively feel into it because we all do know. <laughs> like deep down, I even know. though we've all forgotten, even though the veil, uh, it, it works. You know, the veil is very effective. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a very effective consciousness technology, you could say. So we don't remember all of who we are at the human level. That, that succeeds. But deep down, we all know. Like deep down, we all sense there's a <clears> connection <throat> missing. There is a 
a love that is just like, where is it? You know, we're always looking for it. We, we could say in Christian terms, we're always seeking God all the time. <laughs> we just don't yeah. know it. And we're like looking for, looking for it in this object <laughs> or this relationship or this process or this activity or show me the next thing that'll stimulate me and try to fill that hole that seems to be missing. But we all know deep down that it's in there. And we all also feel the existing living connection that we still have with that higher nature. It's not like it's been completely mm -hmm. removed. I mean, it feels like it's been removed, but in fact, we're already connected right now. And mm -hmm. each one of us, we don't really need an external person. <laughs> we are like deep down, if we follow our own intuition and like feel into our own being, mm -hmm. there is so much there. And so this book is about helping the reader to, to do that. And it's interesting because when we go on this own, our own journey and we are liberated from the box of either, you know, Western ideology or any other religion that people are, are brought up in, even yeah. if you don't read all the things and you do just sit quietly or go to nature or meditate or, you know, un you know, empty your mind, what what I find as evidence that is so convincing to me is that we have the similar knowing that yeah. is already there and it's, it's deep in, deeply embedded in us. And it's about re, you know, coming, recoming into contact with that. And that just makes so much sense to me that we would be having <laughs> those same experiences yes. without <laughs> being told what they are. And it's exactly. like, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. We all have that same internal direction, that same compass or, or whatever you want to call it. We we all are what we really are. <laughs> so it's like you say, when you find that, it is the same. Like if you go read, I don't know, just like you said, it's not about reading. We know it. But, mm -hmm. but just if you just go and read like, I don't know, 10 of the great philosophers or non-duality yeah. teachers or spiritual teachers in the world, you will mm -hmm. find the similarities. Or if you go read, take a thousand near-death experiences, people who yes. have died and seen the other side and come back, you will see the similarities. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. this is a real, this is a real thing. It is a, an objective, um, I don't know what the right words are, but a, a shared consistent foundation that we all yes. come from. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. So when, so when and we it's seek undeniable. down into it, it <laughs> Yes, it's undeniable. It's undeniable. Mm -hmm. Now, what's really interesting, so that undeniable core, we may all seem to sense it really like as a subtle thing at first. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what's really cool, <laughs> I don't want to stimulate the <laughs> ego too much here because this can be a super stimulating idea. But if you go down this path far, like if you really meditate and you really seek out underneath all your fears, mm -hmm. in the depth of your awareness, what am, you know, what am I? If you really really explore that and set aside the time and do it consistently and don't settle for any stories and you're very you know what I mean you're very objective and you really explore and you bring to greater and greater alertness and you meet your own crap and face your own fears there can be experiences that arise that are not physical mm -hmm. in higher reality systems for instance or higher states of consciousness that are so absolutely amazing and blissful and tangible very tangible mm -hmm. not not just, you know, ephemeral, abstract, oh, that's kind of nice, not that kind, no. I'm saying like full, like more real than this experience, real and lucid. And when you experience that, the realness of the higher context, it becomes utterly self-evident. You know, people say, well, how do you know that was a real experience? Man, like, it's like if you say to somebody, how do you know you've seen the sky? Like, how can they convince, you can't convince somebody you've seen the sky. You just know you've seen the sky. But this is even more real. <laughs> I, can't, mm -hmm. I can't even describe it. It's just so self-evidently real. So I'm mentioning that because it starts, maybe, it might feel like a subtle, deep, distant thing. But in mm -hmm. deep exploration, when we're willing to let go of everything we're not, which is the thoughts and the forms and the human association, we may spontaneously discover, oh my gosh, this... This is, this is amazing and real. There are higher reality systems that are so vibrant and rich with color. You, you, you could, I don't even know how to describe it. Color that's alive and that you could stare at all day and would just fill you with joy for, you know, or <laughs> states of being that you know you're not local and that you can mm -hmm. actually feel tangibly that the physical body is occurring within you. <laughs> Not that you mm -hmm. are in a physical body. I know it feels like we have been shoved into a physical body and now we're looking out <laughs> of our eyeballs, you know. Yeah, I can see out of my head, you know. 
But no, actually the body is a set, a set of constraints and definitions that is arising within your consciousness. And there's this beautiful inversion point that can happen when you feel tangibly right. that the body of your aliveness is so much bigger and not local. So anyway, mm-hmm. I'm just, I'm just sharing that because this is not like just a subtle woo woo thing. This is, um, very real, <laughs> very tangible. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it is pretty incredible. I think one time I really scared myself <laughs> asking that exact question, um, not through meditation, but um, looking in the mirror at my own eyes mm. and and looking to see what was behind. Like, it, it felt like it wasn't physically me. Like, I know I'm me and my physical body and all of, all of the things that are, you know, real to this moment. But looking at my eyes and looking at, the consciousness that was behind it. I was like the first time I did it, I like scared myself because I could feel what you're talking about, you know, just for a, a flash of a second feeling that and being like, Oh shit, there's so much more here that I don't understand. <laughs> like that was so early in my, in my, um, my journey. And I was like, God, this is scary. Like, what did I just unlock? And like, and, you know, and it, and it, can, it can feel scary. And I think that I want to talk to you specifically since we're on this, this riff here about the individuation of source that you uh, you talk about in the book. And to me, when I was reading it, I felt like it spoke to something more profound of about how we're trying to connect so deeply with source and one another in almost like if we're trying to put all of the parts back as the whole. And like, we are always all reaching out. We are always seeking God yes. and it looks different and it feels different. And so my question is on the individuation of source like, will we ever become the whole again, do you think? Well, we are the whole right now. Okay. So um, so that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I know that it, it, I know that it, it seems on the right. surface like we're not the whole, really deeply. Like, I, yes. The, we've taken the experience mm-hmm. of separation really far out on the spectrum here. I mean, we're we have, right yeah. now. We're, 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 I mean, anybody listening today, you know, we are doing the extreme sport of coming out as far into separation as is possible. We have <laughs> a gold feeling, medal in it. <laughs> we have a gold medal in separation. <laughs> like, I mean, other beings would look, Some, I mean, some other beings actually do look at us and say, are you, are you crazy? Like, why would you, mm. how could you even do that? How could you even engage in an experience where you actually feel separate from everybody else? That's that's ridiculous. Why would you do that? Oh, that's, so, that's so heavy. So we're doing that now, right now. Like, we're in it. We can't, we, we made mm-hmm. it. So, so the question is being asked from the perspective of this really deep apparent separation, while the truth of our nature is always connected. We never actually mm-hmm. get separated. That's an important assumption to point out because even assuming that you're separated automatically is your consciousness buying into a perception that's not in alignment with the truth. Not, yeah. not super helpful. So if we start with, okay, wait, maybe I really am connected to everything. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then seek, and you that. start to see all of those connections. Yes, they express mm-hmm. even even all the way out here. What I mean by out here is even out here where the limitation set is so extreme in the physical, because yeah. we really are in a very alien state and an extremely dense, high limitation state of being right now. Oh, where the density the, is so the real. The density <laughs> is off the charts, like crazy. It's like going to Mount Everest, and you're like, "Wow, it's cold. Mm-hmm. There's no air up here." <laughs> We got a gold medal in density too. <laughs> that's it. Well, that's what this is. That's what this experience is. It's that. So now, mm-hmm. now that we're here in the density, yes, we are seeking to rediscover. In I mean, in part of what we're doing here is we're seeking to rediscover that connectedness that never left, to reawaken to mm-hmm. who we are, even from here. Because if we can do it from here, like while we're at this point of extreme separation, it is like an expansion of the knowing of the being all the way out to this degree. You see, the contrast is like a creative Mm -hmm. tool. So we do seek to actually experientially find who we really are, to wake up from the dream while we're in the dream, because it's fun to do Mm -hmm. that. (laughs) And because if you can do that here, even when you're out on the mountain, it's like, holy cow, that is some Mm -hmm. awesome and powerful stuff. Yeah. There, yeah, I I, I think it's, it's just so interesting that, that separation, it feels so real. I mean, I know I felt, I felt it for so, so long and it wasn't until I got real far into my journey that 
And I find it in nature the quickest. Like when I am feeling very separate or alone or disconnected. Yeah. And usually I think, you know, most people might say that disconnection is really the disconnection to ourself and everything we are, right? Yes. But when I go into nature, like I am immediately, it's like clicking in. It's like being sat down into like a spaceship and going... Like, it's just immediate for me, and I it remember, It moves you vibrationally like, oh. closer to who we really are again. Because nature is in a state of acceptance. It just exists. Mm -hmm. It's just alive. It's just, it's just being and presenting itself. And we vibrationally feel that without even knowing it. Yeah. Like, we come into yeah. this vibration. We see it. We hear it. We smell it. We're in the presence of it physically. And that vibration of acceptance automatically moves us closer to who we really are a little bit. Just a bit, but enough that we mm -hmm. feel it. And Enough that, that we feel the ease, you know, the immediate yes. ease. Yeah, because mm -hmm. spirit, our true nature is ease and joy and peace mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and love. But it's the, it's just that we've gotten so deeply associated into what we're not. You know, the human story, <laughs> the forms, the negative self-perceptions like, oh my gosh, I'm unworthy of love. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or whatever it is that my parent taught me when I was three and I'm holding <laughs> on to it. Or, oh man, you know, I lost my job. I must be you know, shameful, or I can't pay the bill, so I have no power. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever the negative perceptions are that we think are so real, our association into that is the separator. Yeah. Like the veil permits an obscuring so that we don't remember, but it's our association into the form that makes it right. so real. Whereas like babies, you know, small kids, they've come in, they're not so deeply associated yet, so they just come and go, you know, know. like... <laughs> They're, they feel it. it, but then we tell them 200 times, oh, your name is this, and you need to do this, and they're like, oh, okay, and then the, now that's their character, now that's who they are. Right, and their identity yeah. builds and all the things, yeah. And we well, do that all I the wanna... way till now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I love that you brought up the acceptance things, because this was one of my questions, too, and definitely, I think, like, key curriculum on the spiritual and human experience is getting to a place of radical acceptance about everything, but in mm. your book specifically, you call out accepting what it is. So when you talk about that in your book, what does that actually mean for somebody reading it and trying to understand that concept and how it can help them on their journey? Yes, excellent. So so what is means exactly how things are right now. <laughs> mm. How your life has arrived to you. Your circumstances, so that's the external. Mm -hmm. And the internal too, your feelings and your body, the feelings in your body, the state of your body, the thoughts that you're putting on the state of your body and the state of your life, everything, the whole thing, all of all the form, all that that I just described as form just means distinctions of some kind that have arisen within the, you mm -hmm. know, the metaphorical soup of consciousness you, that you've <laughs> lost yourself into these forms. Okay. So the reason that acceptance is so powerful is it's re so rejection is done out of fear. Mm -hmm. And fear only occurs when we buy into a self-perception that's not in alignment with the truth. So when we stop rejecting <laughs> everything, even things exactly as they've arisen, and we actually say, you know what? I accept this. I'm present with it. This is how it is. It's okay. I'm here now. I'm fully alert. I'm awake here with exactly how things are. That acceptance automatically opens the channel and moves you vibrationally closer to who we really are because life itself is accepting like you could say that source is unconditionally loving that's a, that's like a fundamental i don't want to use the word quality but it's an it's, it's, it's the nature of source is unconditionally mm -hmm. loving and unconditional love is completely accepting utterly accepting it doesn't reject <laughs> it doesn't kick, yeah. kick out or push away it's not how it works so where are we rejecting and pushing away. Oh no, but there's these bad things in my life. You know, there's these pains, there's these limitations, there's these these terrible this person left me or this person abused me or I have this this disability. I reject that. You know, that's what we do. Well, if we decide to put down the false power of rejection cuz raising the mighty fist of the ego it might work in the short term, but it's not true power. If we yeah. put that down and actually fully accept this moment exactly as it has arisen, true strength, true power, true life can rise up and flow through us. And all of a sudden we can find joy. 
mm-hmm. and peace and freedom. It can be present even now, even in exactly this circumstance. And then we're empowered to change it even if we wish. We do that. Yeah. We, we see we can do that from a place not of rejection, but from mm-hmm. a place of of love and and peace. You know, we don't have to lose our peace even as we take action to to help our world and help those around us. Acceptance doesn't mean inaction or inactivity. It's a state right. of being. It's a state of relationship to the circumstance and, and, and a relationship to the meaning we've put on it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it's just such a powerful and alchemic thing to apply in your daily life and then in, in, in everywhere. And I, it's so freeing to be able to accept things as they are um, on my journey in particular, I had a really negative inner dialogue, which you do talk about a little bit in the book. Um, and it was one of the things that really created a lot of obstacles for me that were not, uh, were not obviously real, <laughs> but created, you know, psychological obstacles, uh, let's say. And being able to accept that maybe I wasn't the, the right or not the right, that's not the right way to say it, that I didn't, that, that I didn't accept in those moments that I could be lovable because I had flaws that I couldn't reconcile or because yeah. I had baggage that I was hanging on to or things that hurt me that, that would make me feel like I wasn't enough. You know, I think all this is a common struggle in our human sure. experience. Sure. Everyone goes through this at, at some point. And come for me, I came through acceptance um, in the lineage of my practices and 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 um, education in Buddhism. That's where I first came into contact with it. Mm. Removing that judgment, which you also talk about in the book a lot, allowed such a deep acceptance of where I was and loving the flaws, so that I could love the future part of me that was reconciled to all of that. And I just, it, it's so important to be able to do that, I feel like, and it's so liberating. And it does create this peace and ease that you're talking about. It, I wish everyone could feel that. Yes, no, absolutely. That's really beautiful. Uh, uh, one comment I'll make. I, I didn't mean to imply that that process you just described is easy. <laughs> I mean, it can be <laughs> no. easy. It can be easy, it, of course. <laughs> but uh, the reason I mentioned that is because fear which mm-hmm. is at the root of all this rejection and ego stuff that's going on. It's just fear. Fear, yeah. fear, can, be, fear can be hard. Fear and is f- like the worst. <laughs> it is the worst. No, no, th- no, absolutely. In fact, I mean, really, it's the only real problem. I mean, there's not even a real problem. It, <laughs> but I the know. closest well, thing the, to a problem that exists. The way it exists, perpetuates. Yeah. yeah fear and oh. ignorance are the only two real issues that we have here on Earth. <laughs> yes. Everything else arises oh. from that. Everything arises from that. Yes. Um, so, so uh, the reason I'm pointing that out is because that does, that what you just described. Okay, you notice you have an inner di- dialogue saying you're worthless, or mm-hmm. you, this certain quality about you isn't good. It takes humility and bravery to look at that mm-hmm. and go, "Oh crap, I really do feel that way. That hurts. That really hurts. Yeah. I'm afraid. Oh my gosh, I'm afraid." And then you feel small because, "Oh my gosh, I'm afraid," you know, and I have no power. Okay, so. This may sound like a tangent, but I just, I feel nudged that I should mention it. So when I first went to, so I had a a very traumatic experience when I was 22 and I had post-traumatic stress after this. This was part of what I signed Mm -hmm. up to experience. I didn't know it at the time. (laughs) At the Mm -hmm. time I was only deeply traumatized, Uh, but I went through years (laughs) of counseling. And when I first walked into my counselor's uh, office onto the literal and proverbial couch (laughs) to sit down on the couch (laughs) for counseling, behind her written on a chalkboard was a sentence that at the time it just pissed me off it just stimulated my ego and the sentence was power lies in accepting powerlessness i thought that's bubkis there's no that's i i I automatically was like boy that's the biggest bs i ever heard however i have subsequently discovered that it is oh very much literally true like very Mm. very tangibly spiritually true because we already feel the powerlessness. <laughs> you see? It, mm-hmm. The ego does everything it can to try to convince us we don't. Oh, no, no, I'm going to tell myself this new story. Or, I, oh, no, look, I have value because I have money in my bank account. Or, look, I have value because I belong to this group, and this group's good, and that group's bad, and so now my group's better than yours, and now I got that solved. That all doesn't really work. 
underneath it all, you really have, you know, we really have that powerlessness feeling or whatever it is. Confronting that inner dialogue means acknowledging that actual negative self-perception that's causing fear, that's, that's stimulating fear at the root. And that's hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but what I want to point out, though, is power lies in accepting the powerlessness. So accepting the fact, oh, I actually feel powerless. Or I actually feel like shameful. I, I, I am not worthy of love. Or I actually feel ugly. Or whatever, whatever the thing is. When we actually go into that dark closet, like all the way, like push our way mm -hmm. through the clothes, as it were, you know, and feel it. <laughs> I've used that <laughs> metaphor a lot of times, but it's a great metaphor. When we actually go in there and explore that and actually like feel that into it. And smell the mothballs. And smell the mothballs. <laughs> and we're like, wow, I got a lot of mothballs in here. How did I even know I had 100 mothballs in this closet? And they're terrible. When we really do that all the way, there's this really beautiful thing that happens. Not because we're trying, but by actually going in and acknowledging how we feel. And yes, that may mean lots of tears. It may mm -hmm. mean gut-wrenching, body-racking tears. That's okay. That's fine. That's okay. You're here to experience and to process that crap. <laughs> Once mm -hmm. you really, really process, you find it vanishes because now you went in and faced it instead of running away from it your whole life anymore. And once you face it and process it, it vanishes. And now the only thing that's left is what you already always were, which is peace and love and joy. And in fact, the peace and the love and the joy is actually expanded now because now you know what it's like to actually have been powerless and yet rediscover that you really are powerful. Yes, it's a the beautiful space process. of that expansion. Yes, and you have that forever. Like after the human experience is over, <laughs> You retain that forever. You're like, oh, no. Yeah. No, I know what it's like. I was, <laughs> I was there, man. I know what it's like to feel powerless. And I processed it. I met it. I climbed that mountain. Wow. That's powerful work. Mm -hmm. That's what we're here to do. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. Man, I am literally telling people that all the time. Because when you go on the healing experience, too, th there is this. there are two things that are so true for everyone. It's that, one, we want to just ignore and sweep everything under the rug because that feels easier. Yeah. And number two, that there's this idea that if we confront the things that get in the way from us having a deep connection with ourselves and others or source, yeah. and I think all of us are calling out for that connection, mm -hmm. that if we address it, it's somehow harder, but actually it may, it, it does every time you're just letting go of everything. So you become lighter, you have more space, you have more expansiveness, more openness, all of the love that you ever wanted to feel starts to emanate from yourself out to the world. And you're literally figuratively and literally lighter. And, you know, you can, you can verbalize this. And like you said in your book, like sometimes languages, the language doesn't even do us any favors here. It's, it's not even, <laughs> yeah. we can't capture it, what it is, right? Even you and I trying to say and point to what this is, you have to experience it because the words are not complete here for what that is. Absolutely. I think that everybody's listening, though, who is listening has that intuitive sense, though. <laughs> and yeah. we all seek that, like that peace, that joy. We're like, oh, my gosh, we might think I've been missing it my whole life. But you still know deep down in there, you still know. <laughs> like you may have rejected it your whole life and you may have been it may have been proven to you 6000 times yeah. that you are shameful. But underneath mm. it all, you still know that you are precious and important it's in there it's it, because it's mm -hmm. true it's the reality it's the yeah. truth yeah gosh so good i think <laughs> i probably should have mentioned something earlier maybe asked you about it early in the interview but here we are <laughs> so you keep alluding to something called the veil and people that maybe haven't read your book yet that are watching this interview let's explain to them what you actually mean by that and yeah. then you know um maybe you can also tell us a little bit too about like choosing your life and the situations you had and um, a little yeah. bit about that part of the book because it, it's so fascinating to me. Sure. Yeah, so, um, you know, the veil is a, a broad term that everybody kind of uses a little bit differently, but when I speak to it, I mean a specific thing, a set of mm -hmm. limitations that we wear in order to have the incarnative physical experience. So think of it this way. Your consciousness right now it pre-existed pre the human experience. We don't remember that, <laughs> you know, that because that's what the veil enables is you don't have conscious access to before the human experience. It seems like all you've ever been as a human, man, mm -hmm. that's alien. 
<laughs> anyway, the, the veil is the set of constraints that your consciousness is presented with, like a cloak, that you have to surrender to. And the, and the reason is you're, you have to buy into it, we have to buy into it, mm -hmm. because the soul is sovereign. What I mean is it's mm. a piece of source. There's no, there's no greater authority. You could say that you're a fragment of God. So what can lock God away into a, an experience where it doesn't know itself anymore? The only thing that can do that is God, like your, yourself. The only thing that can do it is your own surrender. There's no other power. <laughs> so, so in my experience, they... Okay, so in, my, in, in very brief, the, I worked with my guides. They presented this life to me. I reviewed this life in incredible detail with all the millions and millions of possibilities of how this life might unfold, what it would be like to experience being Christian. And I made certain requests and I understood certain things about the body and the parents and the context and I knew that I would experience, very likely experience, a trauma in my 20s that would give me a chance to re-engage a fear. My main purpose in coming was to process this certain very, very low vibration <laughs> that, had, that had bested me in a previous experience. And okay, so after I had reviewed everything, there, I, this is a, a longer story I've shared many times, but getting right to it, when I was right about to actually incarnate, I was in this area that can only be described as like a, uh, a mechanic shop or a technician's chamber, mm -hmm. and there were these technical guides there. Um, I don't know how to describe them, but their nature is like mechanical. And I like to call them tinkerers. They're beings who are extremely skilled at veil application. <laughs> I, know, I know this sounds wild, but the thing is the soul is very, very complex. And the physical experience and the context and the body and the, everything that's going on with the life is very complex. So they have to do this thing in order for there to be an effective veiling over so powerful a being because the soul is so powerful. So in order for the subset of the soul, the personality portion of the soul to be veiled, there has to be a surrender into this cloak, like I described. So I remember being in this, this room. It, I describe it as a room, and it's not really a room, but it, it's like a room over the earth, and these beings presenting to me the veil and saying, well, last time, are you sure? Are you sure you want to do this? And I said, yes. And then I remember this plummet in vibration, down, 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 lower, 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 more, lower still. And then like when you feel like you're at the bottom, you could possibly go going more low, lower, 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 lower. And having all of my knowing be cut off and all of my connectedness disappear. Mm. And suddenly being, it, it felt like being shoved inside of a tuna can, like a tiny metal can. And yet, so being super dense, but also super like empty, like the vacuum of space. Mm -hmm. And it was so un it was so uncomfortable. And so the veil is that set of constraints that I surrendered to. Like in, in this case, in this life, I focused on not fighting off the veil because I had done that in a previous experience out of fear. After, right after I had mm -hmm. incarnated, I was still in the womb and I rejected the limitations because they triggered my fear immediately. I was like, I'm not doing this. <laughs> There's no, this is insane. I'm not doing this. No way. <clears throat> so, but this time I just focused on not fighting it. Eventually I did end up, however, deciding I'm not doing this once again. <laughs> so I was like, I'm not tolerating this for a lifetime. This is not happening. And in that case, I, I had this very profound personal experience that is just so beyond language where, oh, the only words are the great I am presence of God, source itself came to me and expanded me back out and I felt all of the universe within me I felt our sun the sun of earth churning it was it was conscious it had a consciousness to it I know that sounds crazy but I knew it I could feel it in me and it was alive and it was it had like a raging bliss to it and and God said to me this is still what you are you can never not be this so I stopped fighting <laughs> and surrendered back into the state of being bodily in the womb. And the next mm. thing I remember is a long time later, I remember being physically born um, the day of my birth. So that's just a super quick high level. But so that's so the veil is that set of limitations that we wear. And even now yeah. I can feel the veil on me. Mm -hmm. I'm not fighting it. It's cool. It's present. It, but it's like in the um, in the police shows, the cop shows, you know, where someone's in an interrogation room and they like there's like a one-way glass wall 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and the police officers can see the interrogate the, the person being interrogated, but you can't see out. That's what it feels like to me. Like I can't see out. Well, I have, and I have these certain memories, but overall, I can. I'm very much veiled. I can't see past the glass, but I can see the glass <laughs> in my consciousness. <laughs> And I'm just like, oh man, like, you know, anyway, I know it's an opportunity so I can feel, I can feel it. I'm wearing it. We're all wearing that veil right now. It is metaphorically like being given a, a weight, like a heavy coat Mm. that we wear on and in our consciousness so that we can operate from this extremely high value, unique, utterly super dense and separate feeling perspective of being human. There's so much opportunity in that. In fact, even just being given a human life is like winning the lottery. It's like so valuable. Yeah. I I know that, you know, people that might be coming into contact with this concept of the veil, like might not understand it because they haven't read your book or just have never heard this before. Yeah. But what you said back there about that feeling of um, that first uh, incarnation where you're like, I was about to say a bad word. Yeah, F this. <laughs> that's, about that's about right. I was about to say fuck that. Yeah, fuck that. I'm not going. Yeah, no, exactly. It's pretty but, much what it was. <laughs> but like, I I have deeply felt that too. I I also have two family members who left this place through suicide, and I deeply understand that that was at the core of what they yeah. were feeling. And so yeah. you can you can imagine without understanding the veil the concept of like knowing we're not this physical body, this 3D world. And that sometimes is really painful, especially because we are this sacred soul in this experience. And because we do, we do and we don't have the knowledge, you know, it, simultaneously, it causes so much internal turmoil. And oh, I yes. think as a seeker, <laughs> you know, that's what we're trying to, we're trying to come, you know, closer and at peace to all of these things to try to like, you know, reckon, I know for me, I'll just speak for myself. Like, that's what I, that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to reconcile, like you said, this, this walk in the physical against what I knew spiritually to be true. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a really, um, that's a really excellent point. So the, so being veiled Mm -hmm. uh, seems to, I was going to say created a big problem. (laughs) But it didn't actually create a big problem. It's actually an opportunity. It seems to have created, however, a big problem, (laughs) a huge problem. And that huge problem that it seems to have created is separation. Mm -hmm. And that's the separation from each other, separation from source, separation from our knowing, from all of our memory, all of our knowing of who we are. Now, it seems like it's, I mean, it's very effective at doing that, practically speaking. But it's just, I'm just, (laughs) I'm, I'm, uh, qualifying it because our true nature is always on the other side. I know that's not satisfying to the separate personality who's like, no way I'm pissed, but I'm just <laughs> pointing it out because the deeper part of us is always connected and is we're like, we're on the other side right now. <laughs> we don't actually have mm-hmm. to go anywhere. Uh, but yes, right. like you said, there is this huge problem now and the, the price of coming to be human is mm-hmm. the pain of that separation. Yeah. And it's a big pain. There, there's nothing that hurts more, really, than mm-hmm. than losing all of what we are. In fact, even I, I heard, um, I think it was Natalie Sudman, the near-death experiencer, I think it was her, I could be wrong, say something like, even one day on Earth, even, even, a comp, even just living one day on Earth is such an accomplishment. I agree with that 100%. Yeah. Even just going and eating your breakfast... And going to work Mm -hmm. and dealing with your own internal dialogue. (laughs) And (laughs) do you know what I mean? Like even just going through those things that seem very day-to-day and routine for us us, from this perspective is huge. It's no Mm -hmm. small feat. It's not a small feat. So then I get a lot of emails from people. And sometimes people will say, oh, my gosh, this is really hard. Uh, I'm paraphrasing. (laughs) And it's like, yes. Yeah, it's really hard, but here now, but here's the thing though. Now what do you do with it? That's the key. It's mm-hmm. not about how hard it is. It's like if someone puts a hundred pounds over you and you're like, This is heavy. Okay, but now you mm-hmm. have a choice. Do you lift the weight or not? And in this metaphor, yes. not lifting the weight is running away. Well, it's all the fear, it's all the ego, all the rejection. And 
not owning our own crap. <laughs> That's not lifting the weight. Lifting the weight is when we turn around and go, oh my gosh, I feel like a, a scared little child and I don't know anything. <laughs> and then we I, actually... I could lift this and get really strong muscles. <laughs> no, but no, what, what I mean is by acknowledging the limitation and the fear, that is lifting the weight. So lifting the weight is making choices that are aligned with love rather mm -hmm. than fear. And all the things that can mean, and there's a million and ten things that that can mean, choosing love rather yes. than fear. So we have... Not, it's not just a, a price. It's not just a great cost. It's not just a huge problem. No, we have an incredible opportunity. And this is one of the things that motivates me so much about sharing this message. This is a huge opportunity. We, sh we can and should use it while we're here and not just mm -hmm. cry and reject it. It's okay yeah. if we feel horror or pain. But now that it's been, now that this contrast has been offered to us, what do we do with it? Because if you can lift a hundred pounds even a little bit, you're doing way more than is possible with metaphorically a half a pound. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm just using this simple, silly metaphor. Yeah. But well, all I mean is in the higher reality systems where the constraints are much less dense, it's easy to say, "Oh, I'm I'm kind. You know, I'm free." But do you really know? Do you really, you know what I mean? Do you really? No, if you come here and you can find your own strength, find your own, the love that is there for you, find your own mm -hmm. love, love the person next to you, even when you've had a bad day, smile at the person in the store and make their day better. Like every time we choose that, we are helping the whole and we are lifting the weight and we are helping love to expand. It's an incredible service we're providing. And that service doesn't mean need to be a heavy-hearted one at all. No, no, our true nature mm -hmm. is joy. So the more and more we align with love, the more and more joyful our life becomes. And then what's so amazing is now we're within this highly veiled, dense experience, and we find, oh my gosh, this can be bliss even here. The bliss of our nature is deeper than this, and actually we can use it and enjoy yes. it in a way that's so unique. Like, uh, just a super simple example. One time I was out of body, and I was curious if I could taste something. So I manifested a vat of peanut butter frosting <laughs> and I tasted this peanut butter frosting and it was the best tasting peanut butter frosting that, that peanut butter frosting could ever taste like for me. However, mm. it lacked a surprise novelty. What I mean is mm. it wasn't surprising. It, it, was a, it was like a recording of the best flavor of peanut butter. Whereas here, if yeah. I put food in my mouth, I will be surprised by sensations that arrive. So that's a very, it's just a, such a very simple, normal example. I'm just pointing out that our, our physical world is full of uh, beautiful sensory opportunities and experiential opportunities, social opportunities, cognitive opportunities that just mm -hmm. don't exist in much less limiting systems. And when we integrate those experiences, we learn and we grow in a way that stays with us far past the end of even our physical death. It's a yeah. beautiful opportunity. Oh, I think the alchemy process of transmuting your pain and suffering into wisdom, into usefulness, into clarity, joy. into kindness, is tr joy, all the things, is I feel like it's the almost one of the highest things we can do here on earth. And what I noticed for myself as as I got further and further into alchemy and, you know, stopped injuring myself, I stopped mm. injuring the outside world. And then I didn't, I wasn't experiencing things at the frequency, like, you know, I would say bad experiences, you know, two decades ago that were, I would run into. And you just realize that, you know, going down that alchemy journey of being able to have the courage to face the things that we come in here, to, you know, whether we choose that suffering, um, you know, people have different ideas about this, but you know, I think we do, you know, I think we choose suffering consciously and unconsciously. Um, and then being able to say at some point in your life journey, like, what is this trying to teach me and mm -hmm. how can I allow it to change me into a higher version of, of myself it is so prof such a profound experience to have in this form. Yes. So, um, fear, like we, like you mentioned earlier, fear is hell. And so, <laughs> so what I mean is if you have fear, you're going to have a negative experience. And, and, and when I say you have fear, that means you have e like ego driven. So if you live a life mm -hmm. that is self-serving, 
and rejecting your own issues and not taking ownership for your life and just trying to get the things that you think are going to stimulate you today, you won't actually yeah. be deeply happy in the long run because we're, love is our true nature. Love is, the, is, is joy and love are synonymous. <laughs> yeah. So, so what, what all I mean by that is you can just look at the quality of your own life and say, am I, am I living a joyful life or not? And if you're not living a joyful life, it's okay. It's okay to mm -hmm. acknowledge and say, oh, wow, maybe I have some fear and some rejection that, that is there. So that's a part of the alchemic process. So basically I'm saying it's not like, so about signing up for suffering, it's not like, this, this, the wording is careful here. It's not like we sign up to suffer. It's that right. we sign up to experience co uh, contrast and a limitation yes. that might provoke our fear, and fear is suffering, okay? Yes. But it doesn't necessarily have to be suffering. No, it never has to be suffering. It's our own rejection that hurts. Even pain, if mm -hmm. you have like a headache or something, <laughs> or not, you know, if you're vomiting or, you, you know, whatever, whatever the negative sensation, like a few years ago, my gallbladder failed me and I had to have it removed and I spent six weeks like wandering around crying. <laughs> Because it hurts so bad. I lost all this weight and I was just a big mess. Even that sensation, it was like I noticed, yeah, it was really, really painful. Mm -hmm. But was it charged? No. It's just pain. It's just a sensation yeah. arriving within my experience. I get to do whatever I want with it. And when the time came to get operated on, I used to be very afraid like years ago of surrendering to anesthesia, as an example. Mm -hmm. But I chose to walk up, get on the operating table with full alertness and not reject it, you know, use that experience. Mm -hmm. That's alchemaic. It's alchemy because it's mm -hmm. like the context is neutral. It's not negative. It's just, it's just something that may be very extremely triggering for your fear. So then face your fear. Use the opportunity. Use the trigger to face and process your fear and then you won't be afraid anymore and love and joy are what remain it, it that transmutation is synonymous with the expansion of consciousness that's what we're here to do it's beautiful so oh. anytime there's something negative it's like a messenger it's like oh wait time out i feel negative <laughs> why do i feel negative and you go see and you'll find usually there's like a little message at your door saying door saying something like i feel powerless because i blah 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 whatever the story is and then okay why, why that? And then you seek down and at the root, you're going to find a fear. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you can always trace whatever is in the present moment down to whether or not you're fully accepting or rejecting something in your experience. And that process of then switching from rejection to acceptance <laughs> and actually feeling and owning who you are and becoming more alert, more present instead of mm -hmm. less present. Owning that process, oh my gosh, there's so much powerful alchemy that takes place. It can be a very physical process too. It can happen in your body like I knew. So yeah. over years and years of dealing with the trauma that I experienced at 22, I've had more chronic health conditions than I care to share. <laughs> um, but I've healed so much because I didn't know it, but my body was acting as like a soundboard for all this deep buried crap mm. that I had down in there. And that, and so the healing that I went through by the alchemy, I like that word, mm -hmm. the alchemy that I went through in consciousness had a very physical element to it, very strong mm -hmm. feelings, you know, during the fear and the negative, it was very physical. And yet during the releases and the expansions, very physical bliss and, and an increase in life force actually, and in health. Yeah. Really interesting. The body is like such an important tool and a part of that process. That's really fascinating to think about it like that. That analogy of the soundboard is really interesting to me. We're getting close to the end. I okay. do want to ask you just one more question about the book here. There were two words that I, I made in bold letters when I sent you my, my pitch email to come on here, which was love and intention. And I felt like those were getting volleyed throughout your text and um, you hear this a lot, I think, everywhere in our consciousness about love. And I think, to me, I haven't heard it described so succinctly as the way you described, like, what it is, how we're supposed to be, or not, I guess supposed to be is not a great word, but like how we should, how we should be growing into love with one another and ourselves and how this is so important and the intention we're putting 
behind in our shared experience of humanity. I wondered what you had to say about those two things in general for the listening audience. Love and intention. What, you know, our love and intention, yeah. Yeah, so the, th- this is really hard to describe and talk about because we have like five words <laughs> yes. in the whole language. I mean, that too. Yes, that too. <laughs> you know, we use the word love. Yeah. This is way. It's deeper. just like it's just like God. It's it's not. It does. It's no, not. No, it does doesn't. Not do, do, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't do justice. <laughs> but love is the closest word we have. Love is okay. So love, we could say, is synonymous with our true nature. Mm-hmm. And so one of the main things we're here to do is to wield an intention. That means the actual why behind our choices. <laughs> mm. The actual why, not the why we're necessarily telling ourselves on the surface. The actual deepest why to align that why with love rather than fear, rather than rejection. Because love is in alignment with the unity of being, whereas fear only can arise as we buy into the illusion of separation and the negative self-perceptions that that triggers. Fear can only respond in, the, in that which is, only arise in that which is non-native. So acting mm-hmm. out of ego is acting in alignment with the illusion that we're not. Whereas love right. is acting in alignment with that which has the true lasting power, the true bliss and the joy and the freedom of our of our being. So what does that mean? You know, in our I'm careful to try to put too many specific labels on what a loving choice means right. because it can mean so many different things. I do try to describe it throughout the book in various ways because our intuition will always guide us better than any words. But love can mean all sorts of things. It can mean compassion, kindness, bravery, strength, surrender, action, discipline, stepping back. You know, it can mean there's just so many things. But the question is, what is that quality of the why? You see, it's not the, mm. it's not the behavior on the surface. And it's not even technically the outcome of the action on the surface. It's the, why, it's the intention that matters. Like if you truly intend to do good, truly intend. That's what matters. Even if that true intention may produce an outcome that is suboptimal for someone, that's secondary. When we, when we mobilize loving intention, the world tends to heal and, and, and become wonderful. We, we tend to brighten each other and enliven each other and just empower each other in a way that otherwise we can't. So, yeah. um, and also I'll say one last thing about, about love. So, so you could think of it in t- love, loving intention meaning two things. <clears throat> one is a quality of virtue in any given direction. So take like um, bravery to stand up and do something when it's hard versus being able to stand back and let something happen or or to accept without action, without losing mm-hmm. our peace <laughs> or something, you know. <laughs> any axis we can come up with, it can mean uh, in either of those directions. So it can mean like, for instance, humility and confidence. Those two things don't need to be um, conflicting. Uh, can right. we know humility, like truly? And, or, and can we know the strength of our own being and that we have nothing to fear and there's never a reason not to be confident? Can we know both of these things? So there's many, many different axes that we might exercise choice making through. Many, many, many different yeah. axes. And so that's one. That's one area that, that love, love learns both. Like it's like refining virtues, you could say, in all these different directions. Mm-hmm. And the other thing that love does is grow in wisdom, and that means deciding which to implement, which choice to make, which end of the spectrum to wield in this context today. And that is also really important, because that mm-hmm. means you have to look at your action and say, like, let's say you're you're in a public place, someone is doing something mean to someone else. So now you have a choice. Do I intervene? Is it appropriate to intervene? And then you can immediately, in a quick second, to, like make a decision. D- and then you find in yourself, what is the quality with which I'm making this decision? So many times we may be called, compelled to step forward and say something. Maybe it's a mother who's treating their child poorly and hurting them or something. And you step forward and say something gentle like, I don't know, you're, um, this child is a loving child. You know, just remind them of, of love in some way. And then they might say, oh, it's none of your business. That's okay. Maybe you're called to step in and intervene. Maybe it's a situation, though, where you see something happening and it's best for you not to step in. That discernment, rather than ego, because the ego go, oh, no, it's way easier for you not to do anything. Or, oh, no, don't, I don't want to look stupid. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
I'm not talking. I'm saying yeah. love means deciding the former rather than the latter, like basically listening to the heart and listening to the spirit and living fearlessly, basically. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, both of those are really important. And that is basically the name of the game. Because if we really do that, we find it's not about the product of our actions. It's not about moving the objects around on the stage today. It's about mm-hmm. your relationship to the present moment, your relationship to life itself. Are you living in joy yeah. and freedom today? Are you mm-hmm. loving the person next to you today? That's, that's, mm-hmm. all, that, that's where the power is, you see. Like we think on the physical, oh, that's not accomplishing much. No, no, no. When you actually process your fear and you actually choose love, the whole collective consciousness of humanity hears it because we're like a big pond in consciousness space and you're like a light going off and then everybody else that maybe may not be able to consciously identify it, but their being can see. Mm. And, and, Mm -hmm. and I'll just say not to, again, not to stimulate the ego, but in thought responsive reality layers, you can see it. Thoughts can be seen and heard and felt. They're op- they're like things. <laughs> mm-hmm. So in the in the pond of the human collective consciousness, when one person wakes up and chooses joy and chooses freedom, even when it's hard, that's mm-hmm. that gives permission to thousands of other people because the temperature of the water shifts up. And now, yeah. so all so you don't have to worry about everything. You just choose the way that you relate to life. And then when you do that, you do raise the temperature of the water. You do help all of humanity. Even if you're behind closed doors, no one has to even be able to see you. You can still, mm. just by like appreciating a house plant in the sunlight in the morning. If you really feel mm. that, and you bring that love into that moment just for a moment, not artificially, just genuine. You just appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Then you have just touched all of humanity. Wow. That's beautiful. I love what you said back there too, about regardless of what the outcome is, having the intention coming in with love, that that's what's important. Because I think sometimes we can also be have that like analysis paralysis when we, yeah. if we want to intervene or we want to help or we want to provide, you know, a moment of nurturing or support or whatever, all of the examples you used right now. And sometimes we can get caught in that like, pull push and pull of ourselves like should i and i think if the answer is am i doing this from a place of love genuine you know love then i'm going to move forward and whatever the outcome is is not important but i'm doing this intently with deep you know unabiding love for humanity this person yeah this one, animal whatever it might be one comment i'll make to that the intellect is in service to intention so what I mean is you're all the learned ideas, all the understanding that you have, that's yeah. that's what your consciousness utilizes and works through. Intention shines through the intellectual choice. So that might mean that a lot of analysis that. that might mean that a lot of analysis can be useful in a given choice perhaps. But many times analysis paralysis also could be ego because we're afraid of doing the wrong thing, we're <laughs> afraid of having some outcome happen. Usually the heart knows pretty darn quick. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I don't just mean the heart, like just the heart. I mean, usually our being, because the soul, I don't want to get too much down this path because I know we're running out of time, but the higher portion of ourselves <laughs> has really good vantage point. It can see everything. It sees, it sees the landscape really clearly. <laughs> and, qui- and quickly. And quickly, immediately, very quick. So then we're on the path and we're like, which way do we go? Do I go down this path or do I go down this path? And the soul says, take a left into the woods. And you're like, <laughs> What? <laughs> because it can see much better than you. And that is an immediate thing. It doesn't take analysis paralysis. It just, you just know. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I'm just highlighting those two things. You know, yes, you may need a lot of intellectual uh, deliberation for a choice, but the deeper being is very immediately communicative. And we know. Like we know what and love. Instinctual, yeah. Yeah, it's like, and it's it's even, and it's deeper even than biological, physical instinct. It's it's um it's spiritual knowing. And mm-hmm. we know in circumstances, we just know like. And and it's like you might do something or choose something that appears so small on the physical surface. It might be the smallest thing in the world, but you just knew that it was like maybe you just decided to sit down for 10 seconds and be instead of like maybe you're walking out of a Chipotle with your dinner in hand. <laughs> you're ready to get in your car and drive home. With extra guac. With extra guac. <laughs> and you just feel like you want to sit down for 10 seconds. So you do. You sit down. And you just experience for a few moments. That could be it. It doesn't matter what's the physical outcome. What I'm saying is if that is the direction of love, then Mm -hmm. it's beautiful and it serves. 
It, it, maybe you affected others. Maybe the traffic ended up differently than you could have otherwise seen. <laughs> you don't know. Or maybe there was no physical outcome, but you just took a step towards joy and freedom. See, basically fun, even fun, fun and joy and freedom, like that, it's a service when we choose mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Well, and I think it, it, it ties into the whole conversation so we can we can wrap it up here, I guess, but it, it calls to the the idea that we are all connected. So when we're making these conscious decisions with intention and love and all of it's happening in the physical world, but there's non-physical outcomes that shift everything. And so that's why we can continue on this path unafraid, telling our ego to back it up <laughs> and just living in into the knowingness and, and trying to, you know, pull up the veil a little bit every time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. One comment to that. So the, the, um, yeah. I'm not discounting the, the meaning and the depth and the importance of the physical, mm-hmm. but it's a big play. <laughs> okay. It's not <laughs> even real fundamentally. It's like a big yeah. shared dream environment. So we are very, we tend Which to. Which is so wild to even fathom. It's very normal, though, from the higher vantage point, it's very, it becomes ridiculously obvious. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I'm just saying that because we get really concerned. How much money do I have today? Or how, what yeah. am I going to do if this certain physical thing happens? Or what if I can't do this certain physical thing? Okay, the, the quality of intention is what matters because what lasts past the physical and what always existed is you, your consciousness itself, your spirit. And what we're quote-unquote learning is that quality mm-hmm. of intention, not the moving of objects. We can create any objects we want. <laughs> We're powerful <laughs> beings. But here in the physical is where we experience lack and limitation and linear time and all these things. So, But that stuff is all not fundamental. What is fundamental is you and your ability to wield an intention to make choices mm-hmm. that is in alignment with love or fear. And so that's why those small things, another reason those small things are so important because when you choose love, that is the success it doesn't matter. It's not about how we've rearranged the objects today. We are loving yeah. beings. So when we can bring love even to where there apparently is not love, that is the success already. Mm. We're done. Done. Are you done? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Actually, no, it's not done yet. Where can everyone connect with you <laughs> on social media, your website? Like, what, where are you hanging sure. out? So um, I, I just, I just have a website. You. Um, it's a walk in the physical.com. Um, mm-hmm. uh, there's a book page there. I have a bunch of talks and interviews there and, um, you can also reach out to me by email. I apologize if I can't respond right away. Sometimes I get a lot of emails, but a walk in the physical at gmail.com is my email address. And the book is available on Amazon or on audible as an audio book. I bought both versions because I wanted to hear you read it while I, re- while I had it in front of me. <laughs> I'm glad that works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it's like, ex- it's like extra learning for me to make Excellent. it all stick, basically. So I want to yeah. end in some gratitude. And I'm really curious about what three things you're grateful for, for in this moment, or oh, this man. week, this year, whatever is like, whatever's in your heart space. Oh. Uh, okay, so one thing I'm really grateful for is a couple weeks ago, I went to the national IANS conference, the International Association for Near-Death Studies, and there were about a thousand people there, mm-hmm. and the vast majority of them were experiencers, near-death experiencers, or other spiritually transformative experience experiencers. And um, the love at this place for four days was like nothing I'd ever felt. And it wow. reminded me that we really can have love and acceptance and celebration of each other on Earth. Because I experienced it for four days in one small place, right across the street from the Pentagon, actually. It was a great dichotomy. <laughs> <laughs> out the window is like the center of the world's industrial military complex. Anyway, so I'm just pointing out that there was that real that there, There's the life contrast. <laughs> there's the contrast. So I'm really yeah. grateful for that because it was like a reminder, oh, this really can happen. We really can live in total love with, you know, acceptance. Mm -hmm. The second thing, I'm really grateful for my children lately. Um, They're Mm -hmm. 14 and 12 right now. They've grown up a lot. They're very precious and independent and strong and beautiful people. And I get to see the rediscovery of the life process from their young eyes. So I'm appreciative Mm. for that. And um, the last thing I'd say is I'm really appreciative of my wife, actually, because she has gone through a huge amount of awakening herself and growth. It hasn't been easy for her because she comes from a very conservative family. 
Her parents are not supportive of, you know, this open-minded message because of their religious tradition. Um, so I'm appreciative for anyone, but especially my wife, who may choose the, 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 the humility and the bravery it takes, like we started this conversation with, in order to question yeah. and actually grow. That's hard. And so I'm really, it's so I'm really hard. grateful for that. And, and I know this, and I already, already spent my three things, but I'm also grateful <laughs> for, for all the people that, that I've met throughout this work who've done just that, who've done what you described and what you're doing now. Because when like, it's not just like-minded, when awakening people can connect, it's like a circuit mm. in the physical. It's like reaching down mm. two connections to the higher realms and touching down here. And it creates like a, like an electrical circuit or a temperature circuit in vibration. Mm -hmm. I'm really grateful for that because it is a beautiful experience to do that on earth. And what an opportunity we have. We can all do that with each other. This kind of podcast helps serve that. And that's really beautiful. Yeah. That's why I named it. I'm awake now. What? Cause once I started waking up, <laughs> I was like, Oh my God, what is next? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I get it. I totally get it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming here and doing this interview. I, gosh, I love your book. I love everything you're doing. I, I, th I really appreciate you spending the six years to investigate and to channel all of those answers. You know, I, I don't know if that's the right term for, for what you did, but just to allow us some insight when we're so confused about the veil and about what's happening. I think I, I, I wish I could have had this book like, you know, tw you know, 20 years ago. I'm also 43 as well. I think it would have just, I, I just love it. And I love that it, it's going to help so many people along this awakening journey. And it's so important. And I'll be thinking about your wife. She's in good company on this podcast for sure. So um, <laughs> I'll be thinking about her in the next few months and giving her lots of, lots of good vibes oh, and wonderful. lots of strength. <laughs> This podcast was written, directed, and produced by me, your host, Chris Ziomara, in alignment with light casting. Music curated and created by Mr. Pixie. You can find I'm Awake Now What on all social media channels by searching IANW Podcast. Head over to your favorite podcast app and subscribe, download, rate, and review. Come back every Sunday to partake in a new and enlightening conversation. May you be filled with love and light until we meet again.